to welcome Paul Conroy. What could possibly go wrong tonight? <laughs> right, 15 minutes start. I'll be exact. Got me note. Yeah. I think it was six years ago, was it, wasn't I? On my drip, and a lot of morphine had gone in me. So I can't remember if it was a good night. I'm assured it was all right. Um, but yeah, I'll, t I'll talk about Syria, but not, I, I don't want to lay on all of the, the horrors. I think we're all more than aware of that now. Um, so I'll try and talk a bit about the spirit of the people that me and Marie met along our way in our journey in Syria. And it's also... Where to remember that when this started, this was a peaceful revolution. It wasn't an armed uprising. The people weren't calling for the downfall of Assad. It was people on the streets calling for a little bit more democracy and certainly not calling for Sharia law. That came much later on in the, uh, in the, in the revolution. Before me, me and Marie went in, we went to Beirut and we spent about a week trying to figure out how we were going to get into Syria. And we met a lot of activists who introduced us to the next level of people. Um, but in that period, we were told by Lebanese intelligence officers that any journalists found in Syria, in the area of Homs, were to be executed and have their bodies thrown on the battlefield. That's before we set foot in the place. So it was, you know, we weren't that easy going in, as you wouldn't be. But we went in anyway. Um, on the way in, it was, it was kind of a bit of a mishmash of routes. We got in a cab, actually in a little taxi in Beirut, and we were taken further down the road, and we were passed on to another person. We then passed us on to another person. And eventually we found ourselves at about midnight on the border between Lebanon and Syria, and it started to snow. And this guy says, right, come with me. I'm going to take you through the minefield. And we're like, okay. <laughs> So we're creeping through this kind of countryside at night. And this guy, it starts snowing. And this guy's got white trainers on. So all we can do is follow his training shoes. And Marie, who obviously was blind in one eye, had a tendency to veer left. <laughs> so I'd be walking along in this guy's footsteps. And Marie would be up there. And I'd run across and grab her and like, you're being fucking Damascus. <laughs> so we're tip throwing through. Then we come to the minefield. And this guy goes, right. And then he stopped and he looked a bit puzzled. And we were like, yeah? And he goes, oh. He said he put lollipop sticks where all the mines were. But it had been raining for three days and it had all been blown away, all drip, drifted away. So we had to kind of follow in this guy's footsteps into Syria, which was also you know, a little bit nervy. But we got in and we were just passed from person to person and these, we didn't know we were getting passed to. These guys had masks on and Kalashnikovs and they got put us in a van. And so I've been told they've got a sense of humor, a real good sense of humor, in, certainly around Homs. Homs is considered to be the Liverpool of Syria. So, <laughs> so, so that was really reassuring. <laughs> Fuckers nicked me cameras. <laughs> no, they didn't. So I, I learned in fluent Arabic, just as a joke, I learned to say, excuse me, may I breastfeed in here? <laughs> on, on the basis that if they laughed, I was in good hands. Um, I was. All the way, they, they took us in. Um, we, got into, we got into a town called El Buey. It took three days, and these people were fantastic. You know, they didn't ask for anything. There was no, there was no agenda other than get in and report what you see, and that's what Marie and I were about, it was, as Mary often said, it was about the people. Um, and, you know, we had a wonderful time with these. With, they weren't all armed guys. There were a lot of media activists. And what we found out very quickly is that in Syria, the order of battle was first kill the doctors. That they were the main targets of the regime. Um, the, the logic being that if the doctors are not there, then the people won't go out to protest because there were a lot of injuries. Next, it was kill the journalists, kill the people with cameras. Um, any Syrian journalists who were caught with a camera at that time had their eyes gouged out, um, were killed, rolled up in a blanket, and delivered back to their families, um, where they were later sent a bill for the carpet they were rolled up in and the rope. 
So that gives you an idea of the level of people you were dealing with. Um, we, we eventually got into homes. We had to go through a tunnel. And uh, there was a lovely old sheikh and his wife uh, were at this little house before we went in. And they were so sweet. They'd bring, come up and bring us cups of tea and little bits of cake that they'd made. And uh, they said, you know, oh, you're going through the tunnel. And we were like, yeah. And no one actually told us what the tunnel was. We thought it was a tunnel under a road about 100 meters long. And it turns out it was three kilometers long. And it was a storm drain. It was about that high. And we had the camera kit strapped to our stomachs. And we just walked for miles through this tunnel. And I, I always remember Marie being, no, Marie was in front. And behind me, there was this guy that broke into this really mournful song, which when you're in a tunnel and you can, the shells are landing on your head, was a bit eerie. <laughs> and, and as we're going through, this guy says, so sad. And then Marie shouts back, she goes, what the fuck's he singing about? And I shout back to our translator, well, I said, what's he saying? And he goes, we're all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to Marie, Marie, we're all going to die. She goes, tell him to shut the fuck up. <laughs> and we shut up. And he goes, so we got through this tunnel. And then, you know, when we came out, that was the, when the reality of the situation struck home. Homs was like, it was like nothing, you know, within, within a, 20 minutes, both Marie and I agreed, we'd never seen anything quite like this. And we'd just come out of Libya where we, we were in the siege of Misrata for two months. But this was another world. It was, uh, the neighborhood we were going to, Baba Amra, was about a small neighborhood. There were 28,000 people surrounded by the fourth mechanized division, which was commanded by Bashar al-Assad's brother, Maha. And, and literally there were no military objectives to this. What they were trying to do was rip, you know, they saw Homs as the beaten heart of this revolution, and it was Bashar al-Assad's um, intention to rip the heart out of this, and they, they thought, if they make an example of Homs, if they do what they did to Hama in the 80s and crush it and destroy it, they will stop this revolution. Um, so consequently, you had 28,000 people being killed by wide area battlefield weapons. These are weapons that are meant to destroy heavy artillery units, tank divisions in open areas. These were being used in urban environments with women and kids being the primary victims. They're the people who least have the least options to do anything. Um, this was within half an hour. And between us, I think we covered war for 50 years, Marie and I, and we'd never seen anything like this. And it continued daily bombardment. They would start religiously at 6.30 a.m., and they would just sweep the weapons up and down the neighborhood. Um, we went to a place, the widow's basement. It was, there were two basements. And this was actually not a bomb shelter. It was an old, um, an old woodwork shop. And then we, we went, went in, and downstairs there were about two, three, four hundred women and kids. And these were the people whose families had all been killed. The husbands, the brothers, the fathers were all dead. And they were keeping them in this basement. Um, at the unfortunate name of the widow's basement. And basically there'd been a, a child born there that was living on sugar and water for 10 days. There was no, no formula milk. The mother couldn't produce milk because of the, um, the siege was being used as a method of, stu uh, of warfare. You know, it was medieval siege being used as a method of, of breaking these people. Um, we continued to report for as long as we could um, I think the turning point came when one of the activists came in with a film he just shot 50 yards down the road and he put the footage on the laptop and it was a young baby about 18 months and the baby had taken a lot of shrapnel to the abdomen to the chest um, and we all just sat around and the doctors could do absolutely nothing these doctors were operating with first aid kits and this baby was breathing its last breaths, and it, was, it got even more horrifying when one of the volunteer nurses realized it was her grandson that had been wounded. And at this point, the shelling had become so bad that both Mar Marie and I agreed that we weren't actually going to get out. This was Tuesday. We normally file our stories on Friday, and we weren't going to make it. You know, the way out was cut. Most of the people we come in with were dead. The activists had been killed. The Free Syrian Army guys were dying. 
So we just made the decision that we were going on CNN and broadcast CNN, BBC, Channel 4, and Marie gave the, the report of a lifetime. It was a last-ditch last attempt at getting the word out to the world of what was happening in Baba Amra. Um, and that really pissed the regime off. And the next morning, 6.30, when our editors had finally talked us into leaving, we hadn't told them we were going back in that too. We turned our phones off and went back, much to their annoyance. Um, and I remember Marie sitting there, the, the laptop started going, it was Skype, and it said, foreign editor, Sean. And Marie's going, tell him I'm not in. <laughs> and I'm going, oh, she's gone shopping. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't even try. He just said, I know she's there, and I said, there she is. Um, so the next morning, um, we were, we, in fact, we were going to go to, back to the medical center to try and get um, a last bit of footage and some last shots before we tried to escape. But the regime then opened fire, and it was quite clear from my, my um, experience in the military that they were bracketing on us, and they walked the shells in. And after two minutes, they put four rockets, Katusha rockets, into the building that we were in, killing Marie instantly and Remy Oshlik, injuring a lot of the activists. And I, I felt something hit my leg. And I, I was remarkably felt fine, but a brick bounced off my leg. But as I bent down, I put my hand on my leg, and it came straight out the other side. And I, I knew that wasn't good, but... I was like, I think it was a bit of shock because I put my hand through my leg. And then the first thing I thought about was hospital food. I went, oh, bollocks. <laughs> All, you know, that horrible gravy thing that happens and nether potatoes. And I had this going through my head. I was like smoke coming off me like a cartoon character. And then I remembered, do you remember when Jamie Oliver tried to feed kids salad and the parents objected to it? And they were like, pushing hamburgers through the school gates. I was like, ah, they can do that for me. <laughs> and then I kind of did come round a bit, and this is where I should have had David on speed dial for this one. I had my hand through my leg, and then I thought I'd better stop the bleeding. So I, th I thought I'd better find the artery. So I was rooting round in my leg. <laughs> Found the artery. Yeah, cool, that's intact. Grabbed the bone. I could feel that. That was there. And I, I put a scarf on, um, I got my scarf and put a kefir around my leg and tied it in knots. And uh, they carried on attacking, that's it, they carried on attacking. And then I went, and I, unfortunately, I found Marie and Remy both dead in the rubble. And then they started attacking again. And the activists were in the house, and the bit of the building I was in had gone now. And these guys just wanted desperately to come and get me. And bless them, they were, they were willing to come out into the, into the barrage and drag me, drag me in. <laughs> and it was actually, I don't know why I'm laughing, but a lot of this wasn't funny. And they, they got me in, and then they said, right, you've got to go to hospital. That was a good idea. And so they threw me in the back of this truck, and this is where it gets, God bless Dr. Muhammad Muhammad, the guy who treated me. This guy is, as all doctors in Syria were, was a hero. He'd had seven medical facilities blown up by the regime. He was one of the only survivors of all seven. And, and we'd spoken to him and got to know him over a two-week period. And he was an absolute legend. When they dragged me in, he was stood there, and he went, oh, in, the, in a true doctorly voice, what seems to be the problem? <laughs> and I was, it was a bit Monty Python. I went, I've got a bit of a hole in my leg. And he went, ah, oh, so you have. And he took me in. And he had his back to me, trying to treat me. And it, he just got a big bottle of iodine and poured it in my leg and had the back to me. They had no painkillers. He said, do you want some paracetamol? I was like, no, I don't like the taste. <laughs> and, uh, but he had his back to me doing shit. And I'm like, what's he doing? And I look over his shoulder and I'm going, yeah, I'm just checking that isn't my alarm. How long have we got? Two. Anyway, he fixed me up. But it, it was a toothbrush. <laughs> <laughs> and then he stapled it all together. Um, I think what I'm trying to give you an idea of is, is in, the, in the bigger picture of the war and the, the tragedy, we see that this is real humanity we're dealing with, real people who absolutely bend over backwards to help a visitor. And that's what we were. We came into their world 
um, trying to help do what we could. And, you know, I don't think it's ever humanized. I hope I've just given it a glimpse of the people that we met and the situations. When, when it was time for us to escape after six days, we were trapped. Um, 21 of them guys set off with us to try and get us out on the way. Within 15 minutes, 13 of them were dead, killed, getting us out. Um, and that goes to show just the humanity that they had for us. And I think the last part of the trip, really, that's worth mentioning, is they put me in the tunnel and they were trying to get me out. And I was refusing to go because there were women and children in the tunnel. And they said to me, you know, get on the motorbike and go through the tunnel. And I was like, I can't, there's women and kids. And they said to me, look, their families are dead, your friends are dead, our friends are dead. And th th they said, go out, tell the world, tell the world what's happened here, what's happening to us. And that's, you know, that's the real reason I'm here today, is to keep telling the world about what they, what they went through and what they're still going through. You know, don't be conned into believing that Syria is over yet. It's not. Um, and it's down to the rest of the world to make sure that they get some justice and the impunity of the regime is, is over. So thanks for listening. Cheers. <laughs>